Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to UAP Studies Podcast. My name is Jason Gilmet. I'm joined by Michael Glosson in the U.S. Hey, as well. How's it going, Michael? It's going great down here. How are you guys? Uh, good. Check this out. I have flannel. You got flannel. I know. It's a flannel You're kind of day, here. you know? flattering flannels um that's yeah, very nice uh for those of you who are not watching but listening uh, just imagine just imagine us in the most svelte flannels that you can possibly <laughs> both beard mind. you know bearded beasts of beauty you know what i mean it's just well nice yeah have. so uh today guys we are honored to have susan alloway who is our guest today susan how are you i'm great awesome Hi, so I think she's actually closer to you, Michael, than she is closer to. Actually, no, I'm closer to you because you're you're in uh, California, are you not? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm closer to you, I think, than Michael is. Yeah. Two West I, win. I win. <laughs> I win. I win. Um, yeah. So Susan, Susan is joining us today. She has an amazing event uh, or events that have taken place over her lifetime, but. I and other ufologists that are going to step up and say so believe that her story rivals that of Travis Walton and Betty and Barney Hill. And yeah, MUFON has taken a lot of interest in, in Miss Holloway's story. It seems. Oh, boy, did they ever. Oh, boy, did they ever. And then Susan will fill us in on that. Uh, this will be part one. We'll have a part two with the investigators that were part of this as well. Uh, I've been... Uh, working back and forth with Susan a little bit on her story to make sure that my artwork is correct based on her descriptions and what she went through. So I will show you guys the artwork as we go along. Uh, and uh, hopefully you guys get to use it, Susan, uh, later on in the year. You know, that'll be nice. Oh, I love that. Absolutely. You got my permission, 100%. You heard it here <laughs> first, folks. Um, this story uh, is the Jack Rabbit's abduction. I think that's the easiest way because everybody has sort of like, you know, the Travis Walton case. But I think this one deserves a title and we'll call it the Jack Rabbit's abduction, which I think it's already known as that. But I love that because it gives me the creeps and there's a good reason for it. Um, so, Susan, uh, let's start from the beginning. Um, just because you were, uh, you know, your experiences as a kid and as you found out later in life, there might have been a family sort of issue where it might have run into family based on what you were able to gather from um, your early childhood and then explain what your experiences were as a kid and how it all started for you. I, well, I just remember, and I had to be about four because um, I lived in Charlotte, North Carolina, and we moved when I was five and started in a new home um, in, a, in elementary school. So I had to be five or four at the time. But I um, I remember I always slept upside down in the bed and it was so I could see into the living room. So when my dad came home from work, you know, I could pop up and go get a hug. But for some reason, I guess my dad had already come home this night and I was seeing faces in the, the glass in the windows of the door. Um, and they creeped me out. They, they were so creepy that I remember doing this um, maneuver <laughs> to flip off the bed and crawl on my hands and knees, um, ran to the bathroom. And my, I was going to tell my parents. And then I don't know why I never told my parents about that. I did tell them later, but um, they knew something was going on because my knees were burned the next morning from the grate and the heater in the floor because it, was the fifties. So, uh, early, early sixties and the heat, um, it burned me because I, and, because I crawled over it, which I normally would have never done that. I wouldn't have even walked over it. Um, and then I got under the covers, but then the same face popped up into the bedroom window, um, from the backyard. And that's the farthest back. I remember, I remember a few things in the backyard that were odd, like the rope swing, that used to hang just a big rope swing with a board on it and a big knot to hold the board on. And um, I remember one day just rising up, the rope curved and the board went up. So the knot was on top and my brother was standing to the right of me and I kept looking at it and the tree, I remember was rustling like the wind was blowing, but I don't remember seeing anything up there. But I remember looking at my brother and he just stared at it, but he was 
very still staring at it. Like his eyes weren't moving and looking at it. He was just kind of frozen. And then I said, do you, do you see that? And he, he shook his head and he crossed his arms and said, nope. <laughs> nope, I don't see that. Nope. It was kind of a strange yep. how, how yeah. old were you when the faces and the rope incident? <laughs> that was four. That was four. That was That's four pretty, years pretty young. Old. And your brother's older or younger than you? He's two years older. And I think, and you know, he was a cop for 37 years. And I kind of think that maybe he had that same mentality when he was young. And yeah, I saw it, but I'm not talking about it because it makes no sense. And how could that have happened? He was already analyzing, I guess, because he was yeah. six, maybe seven by then. And I was four, maybe five, because I uh, then we moved into the new house. And the whole community was full of kids. And um, we had woods in our backyard. And uh, I was really drawn to the woods a lot. And as strange as it sounds, the trees would talk to me. <laughs> so those were my first friends. They, I was like a communion with trees. Um, and they were all dogwood. So the it was just a beautiful backyard. We had a creek with mud that you could dig out and make clay vases and um, we, the bridge. You know, I've always pretended there were trolls under there, um, but there weren't. <laughs> there were raccoons under there. Um, you say that the trees would talk to you. Do you mean like they would talk audibly to you or you would just I sort would of motion you? Them. Yeah, I would hear them. And hear it's them. very funny. When I did my very first uh, podcast, it was with Preston Dennett. Some of my oldest friends from the neighborhood were in the chat. Mm. And they would say things like, oh, I remember she was the only one that could shimmy up those trees, but nobody else could climb them. And I literally, it's because it the trees said climb me. They just invited me to climb them. And it was like an audible okay, you know, like you look around, like, did anybody else hear that? But there's nobody out there. You're just in your backyard in the woods. Mm -hmm. So I climbed it and then found out that if I held on and then I threw my legs away from the tree and just held on with my hands, the tree would bend and it would lower me down to the ground. So I could jump and it would throw me. So I started showing everybody and then everybody was like, climb it. And we called it Bronco. The trees, he Bronco. had a name, Bronco. Yeah. Bronco. Oh, interesting. Bronco, you know, like a bunking, like a fucking yeah. bronco. Yeah. Because it would throw you up. It would spin you around. It was a big tree. Um, a dogwood, just a straight up, but still, you know, probably this big around. But with our little bodies, you know, we'd have three or four of us jumping on it and sometimes climb up on it. And it was when I think about it now, it's probably pretty dangerous, but Bronco was never going to hurt me. And I just knew that it was, it was a personality, just like one of the kids. Yeah. Like a friend. <laughs> yeah. yeah. A, a total yeah. friend. Um, and, and it was a really good uh, hello to the neighborhood before I got to meet all the other kids. And we all went to school together. And it was so funny that when chat, they were like, you were the only one that could shimmy up that tree. And I finally just told them, that part of my magical life and that it would say, you know, just find me. So, um, so uh, I, Susan, yeah. Susan, uh, so you're having these experiences as a kid, uh, mm -hmm. usually from the age of maybe about four, but at the age of eight, mm -hmm. things started changing a little bit and it became more frightening. Um, you had explained to me sort of uh, uh, the the spring situation underneath the bed. Uh, yeah. could, you, could you explain to us a little bit what the shift was and how that started and what the events during that period uh, were like for you? Well, I, I do remember that I would find myself outside of the yard quite often in my pajamas. Um, and Barbie was really big then. And, you know, whatever Barbie wore is what we wore. So it was baby doll pajamas. <laughs> so I was always out there in my baby doll pajamas. And sometimes I could walk in the front door and sometimes I'd come back in the, the back door. Um, and a few times I climbed the tree beside my window and got back in. Um, and I, I believe I, I slept in the hammock a few nights even. But I had this, my, my mother was not a real kind person. And I, I have this odd memory that I can't remember if it was her that was after me or if it was 
one of those strange things that was at my window with the big heads and the big eyes um, was after me. And I remember being under my single bed and grabbing on to the springs, just raw springs, um, like old beds used to have. And my toes were hooked and my hands were hooked and I was holding myself up smashed against the screen so there was a couple of inches maybe four inches below me because I knew if she looked under or if it looked under whatever was looking for me I was in such fear that I was literally smashed I felt like I was melted into those springs and I remember the fear but I don't remember if it was from my mom or from the other presence the alien presence which I didn't know alien then I just knew it was that other thing. So, mm. yeah. And, and it was still acceptable when I knew stuff was going on. It wasn't anything that I would question, but I kept waiting for everybody else to talk about it. Nobody else talked about it. And if oh. I it in the conversation, you know, you, you get this weird look or. But it's, you know, when we were talking about what the possibility in your family, it's, it doesn't sound like it would come from your mom's side. Uh, mom was very volatile, um, yeah. very, like you said, not kind, yeah. not really sharing the characteristics that abductees usually have. Mm -hmm. um, these types of people never have experiences. So it would lead us to lead that maybe your father is more on the side of, of where these abductions have taken place. Um, over time, uh, about my this gra period, my grandmother, yes. my mother's mother. Yes. Yeah. So you were mentioning to me right about this time in your life, you were at your grandmother's house. Could you explain to us what, um, what you discovered there as a kid? Yeah. I always wondered why every window in the house was, was nailed shut with the big old timey nails, big, long iron flathead yeah. Six, 16 penny nails, I think we call those sometimes. Yeah, I think yeah. that's it. Every you can crucify a man with it, right? Yeah they're, yeah, they're long nails, yeah. Even anything that had been replaced in any way or fixed or adjusted, because this was my great, great grandmother's house. And generations had lived there. And I just thought it was so odd that we couldn't open a window. So once I was old enough to even ask, you know, about it, and I remember sitting on the swing on the front porch, and the swing is still there, and um, it's one of my favorite places ever, like, like in the whole world. And I remember her arm being around me, and I said, Mamo, and I looked up at her. She always had this beautiful skin, and she was just rosy and sweet. She was just a real kind woman. And I said, why, why can't I open a window in this, in this house? And, you know, she would just like hold me close to her. And sometimes we would just continue to swing and there was no answer. And for some reason, you know, it was fine that I didn't hound her about it. But one time I, I said, you know, you've never told me. And she said, because there's monsters out there. And she kind of whispered it to me like that. And I think it didn't, it didn't register at the time. But I've gotten older, and as I thought through the years, it registers with me that, that there's just no monsters out there. It's a sweet little quaint town outside of Charlotte. Uh, there's a railroad track in the back. Um, it's a mill town. It's a tiny little mill town. And um, I just don't think there's monsters out there. And I had never seen monsters. And I had never also been anywhere that anybody nailed their windows closed. So I knew it had to be a fear some kind of fear so there is a tradition in in appalachian folk magic and i think in other folk magical traditions of using iron nails um just placing them on the window sills as a way of sort of guarding um entrances and exits and even like um doorways within a house sort of transitional spaces as a way of, of preventing bad spirits from coming out i don't know if, if actually nailing the windows shut is also part of one of those traditions, but I know that, that the iron nail above the windowsill is a thing. Do you think that maybe your your grandmother or her parents had this something like a magical belief system? I mean, you you yourself mentioned in, in your own magical life. 
Right. Well, you know, it's funny because they were very Baptist. Um, so it's not something that we've ever talked about, but I know she was very spiritual and very religious, but she never pushed it on us. But I don't remember anything. Well, I do remember, you know, old wives tales and cultural things because we did live, um, at, at the foot of the mountains. And um, I think all those things just trickle down naturally. Yeah, Within absolutely. religion, um, all, all the things that had happened before and everybody, it, each, each community takes on their own take of it. Mm -hmm. So you never know, but what you said makes a lot of sense because they were country folk and uh, simple country folk. Because I remember my mammal saying that she owed $40 to Spiegel and she felt so uh, for a hat that she felt so guilty that she owed anybody. I remember mm -hmm. that conversation mm -hmm. too. Um, and I have her old hats now. It's kind of cool because I still remember that conversation with those old hats. Well, now you owe $40. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it passes. Well, I'm sure she paid it off, you know, I'm, but it was, it was amazing that, that she had credit of her own. And I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah. You know, that's pretty cool for the early 60s. Yeah. So, Susan, um, during this time, you know, basically from you know, like a change, a dynamics change from about 8 to 12, I think you were mentioning. But there was a period where they didn't like um, they didn't show up. It, they sort of, <laughs> as far as you remember, left you alone until you became a young adult. Uh, it, it, could you just explain to us what that was like? Did your change, did your life seem to change, or uh, did it your future look brighter at that point? Like, what did it feel like at that point of your life? I, you know, it's funny. I always have had this kind of magic to where I think I, I, I think I've always just been one to manifest because I, the the thoughts are, um, how do you say it? My attention's always been good. I've always been innately happy. Uh, deep inside and I've never been I don't think too much of a grumpy person I'm sure I've had grumpy days God, what grumpy must that be like I have no idea what it even <laughs> means to say I've always been a grumpy person but I'm oh, glad yeah. they're out that you're out there but yeah I've always just been naturally happy I, and uh, people say you know it's, so it, it, did you ever get anything dark no I've never had anything dark and it's weird because I never thought this was dark it just seemed kind of magical. I, I remember, I remember one time, it, it, it's just little things. And here's an example, um, small dinner party, friends coming over. I need, oh, I need lettuce. There's extra people. I always have room for one more. So everybody come on. Um, I'm going to run across the street to the little store, literally cross the street and down one block. I want to go grab some lettuce. And so I take off with my best friend and we cross the street at the other end of the street. Who's getting ready to cross the way we just came from. He has this bag and he says, Hey ladies, what are you doing? And we said, Oh, we're looking for lettuce. And he says, wait. And he opens the bag and he said, I just got two for one at that store right there. And I'm only going to use one. So he gave us the lettuce and we ran back across the street and had our party. It's that kind of synchronicity all my life. And um You're like a good luck charm. Well, people say, you know, how is it, it even my daughter to this day uses the, the phrase because she's been she's it's not been easy in my family for the last 10 years because of the divorce. You always get your way. Oh my goodness, there is no getting your way, or I wouldn't be divorced and lost my family. So to her, getting my way is that magic and how I manifest. So, and here's another example. Just in November, I wanted to move out of Casadero because I was so dark in the woods. I had lived there for four years and I needed some sunshine and to be to live without worry of a constant deadfall of those redwoods, which was happening mm -hmm. all around us. Every storm you have to leave. So um, I just spoke it. And then I did my little 
true intention thought. And that night I had a dream of a house with a triangular window. And I knew where it was because I lucid dream and I've lucid dreamed my entire life, even as a child to where I can go, Oh, I know where this is. And you know, kind of rise up in your dream, like you're floating. And I saw the piers, the old piers. And I knew that was Bottega Bay. So I call my, my good friend, Christine. And I said, let's go find this house. I come to this neighborhood. I find the triangle window. I rent the house. I'm back home where I've wanted to be for 10 years. Could you help me find money? Like yeah, a lot of money. Could you, could you help me out? <laughs> you know, it's funny because I've never used those intentions for anything like that, but I feel like it would be like a jinx if I did. Yeah. So I, but, and it's funny, it's for years, whatever that is, that extra little special something, I've always used it for the positive because I've never seen dark stuff ahead. But I was really mad at myself that I didn't see the divorce coming. And I, and it took me years to get over being mad at myself. And during that time, I could not manifest where the crap. I couldn't think straight. You were in a negative space, right? It yeah. was the... It, you know, it was just a, a place of no flow because as soon as the flow came back, the dream came back. And here I am sitting in where I want to be, 200 feet from the water. So it's so, those, and people confuse that. It's not magic. I do no spells. There are no, there's nothing. I, you just send it out there and you speak your words because the spoken word is so strong. And as, if it's intentional, and you'll find in this story that, that I'm getting ready to tell, I spoke them and intentionally, not knowing that I, what was getting ready to happen. So, it's, so what is that story? <laughs> tell us. <laughs> no, no. Well, well, guys, yeah, we're, we're going to stick on the, there's quite a bit to cover. So yeah. let's stick to the I'm subject. Excited. Of, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, yeah. Excited yeah. Well, I have a two-parter. We could, uh, we could always ask then. So, um, there's a period where you're not uh, experiencing any, uh, you know, any more contact or visitation as far as you know. Let's start again when you become a young woman and your life changes. You uh, end up in the military and maybe mm -hmm. you can walk us through that phase of your life until the, the desert camping night um, with the shoe. Okay. Uh, that's all I wanted to say. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, I was stationed in Norfolk and nothing happened during that time, you know, just the normal fun stuff. And then um, after six months, I decided that I wanted to go to Hawaii. So <coughs> I made that arrangement in the Navy, got the transfer. And um, we had C-130s and C-118 aircraft. The big carrier class, the, the big. Yeah, the big, huge plane. One. Yeah. Yeah. So um that was in 1975 and um, at the very end of, of the Vietnam and there was a lot to do. And I was the first woman on the flight line. There were no, there were 400 men and me. So anytime that I could fly and figure out what our squadron did, I would try to, you know, can I go? So even if it was to, to test a new engine, it was, so there was so many times to fly. It was endless. They they were going all over the world. So, um, what was your job I, in the in the Navy? I was a, I was an electrician, um, oh, aviation cool. electrician. But I I loved working on the flight line and just working with the airplanes because it was busy, busy, busy. Um, no downtime, and it was exciting, and I just enjoyed it. Um, mm. And it just totally became part of my life. And I remember the first time I went up in the airplane, the first time um, I was somewhere between, I think, Hawaii and Oahu. And I remember saying, what's that out the window? And it was an orb. And it was, there were two orange ones. And then at one time there was a gray, dark gray, like a silver, but I didn't really see it shine, but I knew it was metal. And every time I would mention it, they would just say, oh, nothing, you know, we don't talk about that. And that was no answer. 
that was just not an answer. And then I got the finger in the face. You don't talk to me about that. You don't talk to anyone else about that. You know, if you want to be transferred, just bring it up again. Okay. And then somebody called it a foo, but couldn't really explain that. And, you know, there was no computers that you could really run to and look at things up those days. Called it, called it a foo? Is it like a foo fire? Foo. From, yeah. 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 Gotcha. Because no yeah, exactly. And so, you know, I, and I had heard about that, but then I thought, but that was a long time ago. I'm not thinking alien or anything like that. And I don't know why I didn't instantly associate it with those other oddities in my life. But, you know, not the right time to bring it up for sure when I was in the service. So I just kind of let it go. And then um, after two, two and a half years was transferred to San Diego. And then I met a whole new bunch of people. And um, I had some of my special friends, like really fun girlfriends to hang out with. And we camped all the time, like mm -hmm. eight weekends in a row, every, you know, and they were professional. They were all bank people. I was in the service. We all met through the bank. Um, everybody camped, went four wheeling. We just did everything fun in the desert, San, uh, San Diego and the mountains, because you've got everything right there and the water. So, um, and then um, that brings me up to where Jason said to stop. <laughs> yeah. So basically <laughs> um, at this point, you're you're the only girl in this troop of guys. So you're kind of like yeah. the little sister. They're all looking out for you. Yeah. Um, and and, you and get... they still do. They're still my best friends. Yeah. But yeah. It, it, you, you mentioned there was still some, you know, the fact that you're a girl, you know, it wasn't, you know, it's 1975. So it wasn't like the same as, as today. There would be remarks made or whatever, just because oh, you were yeah. the girl. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it wasn't a great. Now, this is the same year as obviously Travis Walton. Uh, I think his was on November, November 5th or something like that. I'm not quite sure. Um, Which I had no idea about. No, right. about it. Because there was well, no place to go to listen to UFO stuff. It was like a forbidden thought if you were, right. I was. Yeah. Right. So um, you, get, you get to go out to the desert uh, with your friends. You guys all have Jeeps and amazing um, hang on two seconds. I got an antivirus. Uh, no, it just, it, I don't want this. Hang on two seconds. I'm going to get, uh, I'm going to get Sage to edit this, edit this out, uh, to make a chance. No, get out. There you go. That's better. Um, Is that a notification on your computer. Yeah. It's just uh, cause my, it's a brand new computer, but they let you like have a antivirus, uh, oh, test like trial, or whatever. Or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But now it just pops up in the middle of interviews. Um, but uh, yeah, so at this point you're you're going out. Uh, you know, you guys decide just to go for a joyride, but you end up <laughs> camping. Uh, you know, just because you're out there. Maybe explain to us what that day was like, and then especially what your evening was like. Okay, so we went out to um, Bodega Springs, um, uh, Anza Brega uh, State Park. I think it's. I don't think it's national. I think it's state park. Um, In California, out though. Yes, out in the Anza Brega Desert. So it's the desert of San Diego. Once you okay. get past the mountains and then you're into the desert. And uh, I had never been out there before. I had been on the edge, but, um, and we really hadn't planned on staying the day, but I always am prepared to have pretty much everything. But I didn't have, I wasn't prepared with boots or shoes. I just had a pair of sandals on. But um, we, we went places that, were so amazing that you have to go up on two tires and put your other two tires up on the rocks and turn your vehicle sideways to get through. Mm. And I had never done that. I had done, you know, in the Carolina mudding and things like that, but never anything like this. And these guys were amazing. And I have known them from work. So for about a year and um, I would have never gone out there if I didn't trust them, but I, I still didn't know all of them. So mm. we found a, a place to pull over and, we had one fire wasn't enough because there was weird noises out there, not just coyotes. It was called Coyote Canyon. And we had gone way out the entire day. We had gone maybe 
five miles an hour for the entire day. <laughs> you know. And how many of you are there? And they're all boy. You're the, you're the only girl, or it's yeah. They're they're all guys. They're all helicopter guys from the helicopter squadrons. And then um, I worked at AIMD, which is Intermediate Maintenance, and uh, Rick was from there. And um, I had been about I how had, many of them? Uh, there were three vehicles and uh, I think five guys. Okay, and you, so six people total. Yeah, and me. Yeah. Well, there were five altogether. Okay. Yeah, there was five altogether, actually. And I remember just kind of pulling. It, it's not really a road. It's just kind of a trail that it's it's a way between A and B. <laughs> between oh. A and B. So we just pulled over out of the road in case anybody rolled through. But it was already dark and we had our fires going. And um, I remember wanting to make myself a safe zone because I, I, we weren't going to stay all night. It's not the plan. But um, Rick said, I have sleeping bags. So I got a wrench and took the seats out of the Jeep and set them off to the side and made myself like a, a safe zone. In other words, nobody comes around me tonight. That's how you have to do it when you're a military woman and you don't know everyone. You just make yourself a safe zone. You would be 19 at this point, wouldn't you? Yeah. Uh, 75? Been, well, no, I was, um, this was at the very end of 75. So I was, well, I was getting ready to be 20. Okay. Yeah, I was yeah. 20. And, and, and the worry is that, that the men you're with would like sneak into your. Like, no, it's just, you? It, you just never know as military women. Because sometimes you just sleep like puppies together, you know, but you, but there's always one that's got something else on his brain. And even though most of the time I could be like one of the guys, I wasn't one of the guys. Um, and I just felt my mind just said, make yourself a safe zone. So, so just, safe zone doesn't doesn't literally mean like a like a barricade of any sort, but like. Oh, like no. <laughs> Ordering yeah. off your own little area to sleep and like have some privacy or, or whatever. Yeah, because they all slept on the ground, but I knew what was on the ground. I mean, there were snakes out there. There's yeah, the there's scorpions and shit. Scorpions are everywhere. They're everywhere. So um, I just got in the jeep because I was off the ground. Mm -hmm. So they're um, all drinking, and I've never been much one to drink. And they were all drinking. I was just enjoying the stars, just completely enjoying the creepy sounds and the stars and listening to their conversation was hilarious and then went to sleep. And when I, I woke up just all of a sudden and they were all quiet, like really still on the ground. And I saw a blue, which looked like a shape, like an egg, but on the small, on the small end, it was kind of rounder that, came okay so there was mountains and so and, and with the mountains you've got the highs and the lows so through the lows peaks of the mountains i could see it come right in over the desert and then it stopped and then it shot these little poo 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 these little blue dots out of it so to me i was waiting for something to hit the ground something's going to explode what is that uh, military flares i've been around military flares that didn't look like military players. But then again, you know, the military is always doing something that we don't know. So I just kind of summed it up to maybe that. Nobody else saw it because everybody was asleep. Um, and then as far as I know, I laid back down. But the next morning, I knew something was wrong because my shoe was gone. And it, it was a high rise. Everything comes back in style. It was a high rise flip flop. Hmm. with yellow with rainbow base it was it's hilarious it would be noticeable right oh, It'd be it, noticeable it, in a desert it, yeah down in the desert yeah because it was nothing but rocks and sand and dirt and we had burned uh any tumbleweed there was to keep our fire going so you know we went from tumbleweed to tumbleweed kind of lit it on fire and it lasts 20 minutes and go to the next one that's kind of how we stayed warm so the fires were very small and they were still glowing when I went to sleep, but when I woke up and I couldn't find the shoe, it was all about, you know, making the joke in the guys. Okay. Who came around last night? Who took my shoe? Nobody. They all looked at me like, you know, we could care less about your shoe, which I knew. It just seemed really odd because I looked at my foot and I had not been walking in the desert because you would be, your foot would be ruined if you were walking in that desert in the dark. 
you know, you know you'd have mm-hmm. sand on in between your toes and oh that would be, be noticeable prickly. yeah it would be pricklies there oh it would be miserable because we're Metal out and all sorts of weird stuff sticking in you yeah 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 and we're out in the elements too and there's you just never know that's why i wanted off the ground so we looked for the shoe we couldn't find it so i remember having to ask one of the guys okay so i gotta have my foot covered up if i get in and out of the jeep but as you're going you have to get in and out sometimes you know they yell jump and you have to jump but don't ask questions you know you, you just don't want to turn over if they say jump that's to save your life so all we had gone over all those rules so i knew i needed a sock or something Nobody else had an extra shoe, and I only had one flip flop. So I got a, a sock, you know, and there's like nothing worse than a sailor sock. <laughs> oh my God. I hadn't thought about that. It's hilarious. But, okay. you know, that one sock, you know, and, and the big joke is when you're in the service um, and you're an electrician, you're a one wire. So I was a one wire, one shoe. I heard all the jokes. It was like, okay, I'm over it. Um, after years of being in service with guys, I was just kind of over it. You know, I just knew how to take it and let it run off my back. So we got, we packed up and we started forward. And all of a sudden, about maybe an eighth to a half a mile, my shoe was up on a cliff. And on the other side of the cliff, there was a sheer drop, just a sheer cliff drop. And the shoe was just sitting up there, and the guy stopped. Um, it was Grizzly, John, who was driving the first truck, and then Rick, and the other guys were behind us. And he pointed up, and I was like, oh. You're like, why is my shoe up there? So all kinds of jokes. Somebody, I had taken a walk in the middle of the night and lost my shoe. Yeah, not on the sheer cliff, and I would have known if I took yeah, a walk. Spider-Man, right? You could climb up. Yeah, clear yeah. shoe. Yeah. Well, the whole thing I noticed is it was completely smooth. If you walked on this, it would eat out a spot where you had taken a step and it would cave in on you. So you wouldn't go fast to the top. You would have to dig, dig, dig to get up there. So John did it and he brought me my shoe back. And and then we cast it aside, put it on, cast those thoughts aside, how it got up there, because we were just having a good time and we we're going to go forward. Well, it was on my mind. How did that happen? There is no explanation on that, <laughs> but it was one of those, you know, okay, check. It happened. It's over with. Doesn't need an explanation. A whole lot of my life had been like that already. There's unusual things. Um, and as we went forward, all of a sudden, we found these giant boulders probably as big as the room I'm in and inside the circle of gigantic boulders, there's no road. And we saw a green Buick, an old green Buick that had, it was a fancy green Buick uh, with, but beat just beat to heck because of the sun and the, the elements out there in the desert, but it had a black uh, vinyl top that had kind of curled up and the covers, the wheel covers, which was, you know, means it was the fanciest design Mm -hmm. had, had, they, they were green to match it. It was like a grassy green had curled up like this on the sides. The trunk was sprung. Of course, for us to get to it, we had to get on our bellies and crawl through rocks. There was no entrance. There's no way. It's impossible. So it's completely encircled that, in boulders if, and, and big rocks? Y- yeah. It had to have been dropped from above. There is no way. And we talked about that. You know, the guys measured. They did everything they could to figure it out. A whole lot of laughter, a whole lot of smart aleck, you know, ways. And, and I remember saying, the only way that's going to come here was to be dropped from above. Well, they're all helicopter guys. And they were like, oh, 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 oh yeah, I was going to do that. You know, who's going to do that? Well, so there was another odd thing. We get back in the, and we keep going forward. And we talked about that for months about losing my shoe. And it, the what happened to the shoe actually came back. Um, 
years later. As a matter of fact, in, in 2022, I finally found out what happened to my shoe. This was under hypnosis, Susan? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So could you, can we go back now to that night in the Jeep when you saw the light? Um, could you recount what you remembered from the hypnosis session? And guys, keep in mind, this is 1975. Uh, the major event uh, that in her life is coming up three years later. But let's go back to the Jeep because this is an important bit of information. So, but, under uh, so wait, but let me ask about the hypnosis. So this is what you were calling under hypnosis now? Um, yeah. Can, can you tell us a little bit about who the hypnotist was and like what made you seek out hypnosis in the, in the first place? Okay, so this is where um, John Yost movie, Alien Abduction, answers. Mm -hmm. and, uh, my heart's, I almost can't talk about it, but this is for you, John. I'm doing this for yeah, you. Yeah, we recently lost John um, yeah. this week, so yeah. Oh, it just hit me. He was my he, he like a total hero, and I don't even know how to explain this, but I was working at my desk. I'm an artist, and I literally heard it from an, an, in my ears, not as a thought, but it said to go look up the UFO movie. And I, well, I was thinking, well, where did that come from? But I did. I went to the iPad, and I went to Amazon, and I wrote UFO movie. And that was the same day that John's movie was released. Uh, and I bought it, which I never buy a movie. I usually just rent it. And remember, I had just stopped, heard it, found it, sat down in my chair, looked to see what it was about. And the first 17 seconds just sent me to to the floor in the fetal position. And then I crawled up on my bed and um, his movie had, had said the first 17 seconds, how um, the government has always known. And he had had to lie his whole life to cover up what had happened to him and how it was time to tell the truth. And it just set something in me that I knew there was no more hiding that after all the years of trying to tell my family and friends and getting the side look, and um, I never pleaded for anybody to listen to me, but inside I was for them to just listen. And um, all the jokes and the kids saying, oh, that's mom's world, you know, one of those weird things that mom does. Well, all of that just didn't matter anymore. And um, I got a call to action with that movie and um, I didn't know what to do. It took me two days to finish watching the movie piece by piece. Didn't get any work done. I was just kind of, you know, that, Ooh, what am I going to do? How, how do I do this after 45 years? And of all weird things, I called John, the producer, John Yos. I just, went to Facebook and I just hit and he answered and I told him what had happened and I needed help. And I'm sure I sounded crazy because of how it happened. We were total strangers, but he sent me to Deb Shopti Buller and Deb's is the hypnotist in the movie that helped John remember all the things that had happened, just like, I had always remembered, but there was only a small part that I didn't, and that's what I wanted to know. And um, I contacted Debs and then had four hours with Debs, and for about two and a half hours I was under hypnosis, and amazing stuff came up. And after the places that I told her I needed to know about, this just showed up with the shoe out of nowhere. So this is what happened with the shoe is I was coming to the end of seeing that nine hours of missing time that I'm going to tell you about later. And all of a sudden, and I, I this is on videotape when I was under hypnosis and you could see me, I felt it was so fun watching it. 
because I remembered remembering. And I looked down like I was, because I was experiencing it in real time. And I looked down and here I'm sitting on the sofa, you know, in a hotel room for good internet and uh, doing the Zoom under hypnosis. And I looked down and I said, the shoe, the shoe. And what I saw was the shoe had fallen and drifted off of my foot because that night in the Jeep, I was lifted up and taken by whatever that blue egg thing was. And I remember looking down on the way down and seeing the guys from high above sleeping with the fires and then just going right back into the Jeep and then waking up. But I saw the shoe. It literally just came off my foot. It was like slow-mo. It went and it just disappeared. And now I know where it went to. And that totally explained to me. And when I came out of hypnosis, I wanted to just Grizzly's past, but I wanted to call Rick and say, I know how the shoe disappeared that night and why we found it so far away. So and it, it's amazing because the shoe was quite vibrant in colors, you know, like uh, yeah. the way you describe it, it's yellow. It's got uh, uh, almost a rainbow soles yeah. or something like that. Like it's visual. You could see it at night yeah. when it's falling off. So do you remember at, at what speed you were taken out of the Jeep? Like, do you have an idea of the velocity at which speed they took you out? I was just floated out I, and I just floated back. Because it wasn't the first time I remembered that. Um, I actually remembered it under hypnosis that had happened when I was I was actually falling to the ground. And it was terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. So you have this experience. And while you're still in the service, uh, you get injured um, by a jerk who. That had uh, happened in Hawaii. Yeah. Right. That, was yeah. that before this incident or in between the two incidences? It was before. Okay, before. So she, and this comes uh, to play because she, she got very severely injured uh, by a jerk on uh, the ground, uh, basically used a hose and hose her off a wing of a plane and she ended up hurting herself very, very bad. Yeah. Um, so, you know, this stuff is happening in your life. You're a young lady. You're, you're you know, trying to make a career with your military moves. Uh, this happens to you in 1975. Do you remember or account anything weird in between 1975 to September 1978 when your other, uh, your big, big one happened? Well, actually, actually that happened in 77 after I was in San Diego. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 77 is yeah. a big year for UFO activity and yeah. abductions. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. And, and the weird thing about that, too, is during John's movie, during John Yost's movie, he got his realization of what had happened to him as a child in the same Borrega Desert, Anza Borrega Desert. Oh, interesting. That's same location he, when you guys found the car, too. He got, right? like, reactivated because he saw the light in the sky through his, his drinking glass when he was doing the cheers and... That was part of the movie. And when he said where it was, oh, holy smokes, because that um, so I've just, been there many times, but I didn't remember yet because I hadn't been hypnotized. I knew something odd had happened because how else did my shoe get put so far away? You know, but drawing to any kind of conclusion that it had anything to do with the egg that I remember, I don't, you know, I didn't at the time remember being taken by that egg until hypnosis so so can i ask a, to, a sum up to make sure i'm understanding the, the trajectory of the story like you you go out on this sort of desert camping trip and yeah. you have this experience laying in the back of the jeep and you see this sort of egg-shaped thing and it kind of shoots maybe spheres of light out of it is that it, yeah it was it, like two 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 like little like like bullet shaped, just like it was. Like uh, Star Wars lasers, right? Yeah. Almost okay. like balls yeah. of yeah, Star yeah. Wars lasers, yeah. Yeah. It, it and releases I, you know, or shoot. With no sound. 
And it, it didn't land on anything. When something that big you can see is going to land at the desert floor, you're going to hear that. I just kept waiting, and it was total silence. And that was weird to start with. So that happens. And then you sort of, for a moment, wonder, you know, what the hell was that? But then kind of shrug it off. It's a military thing. And I just then, went you, then, yeah, you, you go back to sleep, or you remember going back to sleep. Then the, the shoe mystery happens, and the the weird car thing, but then you yeah. kind of go on with your life and then you see, or, or you're working one day and you get this kind of voice in your head telling you to go watch this. Um, years later. UFO okay. movie. Years and years later, like, like yeah. 30 years later or something. Right. Um, oh, well, we haven't gone to the good part yet. Yeah. Michael, we haven't even gone, oh, to, okay. gone to the well, good I'm stuff. Just, yeah, yeah. It's, I'm There's making, more. I'm getting the, the order yeah. of things. Right. Um, yeah. No, I did go back to that desert in 1978 with all my girlfriends on my 22nd birthday, they took me out to this. To, I, I took them, this is where I want to go. And they drove me out in the big old truck and a camper and they hid a birthday cake under all the camping food, which I thought was really cool. Cause in the desert, you know, what's the thought of coming Thank up with it? Yeah. That it's not completely melted. Um, and it was quite hot out there already. And when we got out to the desert, to that same desert, the first odd thing is Jackie's truck started having um, vapor locks, which it had never done that before. So what is a we, vapor lock? I'm not quite sure in the engine what happened, but it would run for about half a mile and then it would chug out. And then we had to wait for it to cool off. And then. Oh, I see. Yeah. So Overheating, we yeah. decided to move over, you know, like next time it goes, we're going to move over to the left of the road. We're just going to camp out here because you can do that. You're just mm -hmm. in the middle of nowhere. And it's not really a road. It's just a sand trail. So um, we just decided to camp there. And we had, every time we ever went to the desert, we just had a blast in that desert because weird things happen. And this trip was, we saw weird things in the sky. And then we heard, uh, and then we dug water. We saw wet spots and we started digging and we were burning up. It was hot digging and digging with anything we could find to dig and then water started coming up so we had this little water pools or our own little water or oasis that we could just sit in so me and all my girlfriends were like half clad in clothes all sitting in our pool of water everybody kind of had their own uh, eating cake <laughs> in the <laughs> desert, desert. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what a scene yeah a yeah. Scene. yeah we wanted it we wanted to have our cake and eat it too i kind of say and then the weirdest thing is marlon perkins who was one of my tv heroes who was in the Explor explorer clubs and he was mutual of omaha's wild kingdom he was the man that was on there for my whole you Dr came driving up on a metal little two wheeled dirt bike with a leather pouch. And he was like super, the brownest, most leathery person I had ever seen. Ever Real before. Indiana pure, Jones, right? With pure white hair. But I knew who he was. And so here I am sitting out in the desert with my girlfriends. We're all eating cake. And are you Marlon Perkins? That was so weird. So random. And, and all of your friends can yes. confirm that this happened because it has like the logic of a dream to it. Yes. You know, like so out funny. in the desert for a Very birthday and a pool yeah. and cake and, and more famous people driving by. Yeah. And it's exactly like I have a dream. These it's are funny. my girlfriends and they remember it. They remember it that it was hysterical how it happened. And he wanted to know if he could take pictures of us because he had just never seen half clad women out in that desert before sitting in pools of water eating cake. And I'll remember how it just sounded so funny. And he had this big grin on his face. And to this day, I wonder, um, I know that his widow is still alive and somewhere there is a museum, I'm sure, full of all of his photography. But wow, would I love to have a picture of all of us together that day. It was uh, me and Karen and Jackie and Rosie and my good Navy friend from Hawaii, um, Deborah. And uh, I'll, I'll never forget that trip because it was magical. Like my all my other, like my world was, it was just magical. He was my hero. And there he is in the middle of the desert. Him and Tarzan, you know, those are the two. Johnny Wisemuller. <laughs> 
<laughs> it was just nothing. There was no vines for Tarzan to swing, yeah. right? Yeah, so yeah. Every time we went to the desert, you know, that something happened, and who would have ever thought Marlon Perkins happened this time? But um, it was a trip we'll never forget because who gets to sit in the desert and dig a hole and water is there, and then you get to eat cake and just have a wonderful open, huge sky and no other events. But I do remember my friend Deborah was she had all the clairs she's very clairvoyant and magical um which kind of was bringing my intuition and all of that to me which i already had but she kind of enact re reactivated that in hawaii and then again in california um and she was on that trip and i remember us trying to summons you know, let's let's call a spaceship or something. And we were all giggling and laughing. And she said, do you really want to? And we all looked at her and we all said, no. <laughs> <laughs> because I figured that maybe she really could. And I was like, eek, you know, change my mind. So, but you said you did see strange things in the sky on that trip. What were those? Just, um, you know, when you're out there desert in San Diego and there's military bases everywhere, it's hard to say. But a lot of them didn't have the military lights, blinking lights that you see, any kind of aircraft. And um, just odd movements, but nothing that would, nothing like directional changes, just still stuff going over. But, you know, that's when everything was coming alive and there was a lot of stuff in the sky that you don't usually see. And we're in the desert, so you kind of expect to see something. But that's because in your perception, the stars come all the way down to your peripheral vision to where normally you've got trees and other stuff. That's a perfect half glow, dome. right? Yeah. 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 So you're, you're very reactive to everything that moves because you've got the lights and the stars twinkling all the way down. So sorry about that. Um, so that kind of makes you super heightened in your in paying attention to what's going on yeah so and I, and we, we just kind of summed everything up to that and you know went home and it was no big deal but then but that was just a couple of months before i got out of the service right so a couple of months you get out of the service um now this is 1978 so it's about a year later approximately from the shoe incident uh in the oh. desert um you get this great opportunity from a coworker. Uh, yeah. Tell us about this opportunity and how this road trip that will be uh, very much interrupted came about. Well, um, Karen and I had just become best friends and we had moved in and we were sharing an apartment. And um, we had decided when I got out of the service, I wanted to get rid of all my uniforms because I wasn't quite sure where I, where I was going to work, what I was going to do. And I, I wanted to see my family it had been about a year. So all of my stuff that I didn't want to keep, um, we were going to drive it east. And all I had was the old Vega then. <laughs> You'd have to stop and push it over a, a speed bump sometimes. It was in that bad of shape. And oh, she wow. had a, like a 240ZX uh, that was kind of new. And so we were going to drive that because that's what, that's what we took everywhere. Um, and we knew it, it, it was really easy to drive in the mountains. And we were just looking for, you know, a fun cross-country trip to North Carolina. And neither one of us had ever driven a cross-country trip, you know, just like, just with us. Um, so all of a sudden, somebody from the squadron, or from some, somebody from AIMD had asked us, would you like to drive a brand new Volvo wagon? because I need it delivered in North Carolina because I'm getting out of the service and me and my wife already have cars to drive, you know, across country. And I was like, wow. Yeah. You know, of course I'd like to drive your brand new car across country. And, and then he gave us $1,500. So back in the seventies, that's a lot of money. You could stay in the finest hotels. You could have a lot of fun on $1,500. Was that like equivalent to five grand these days? Like how much would that be? Probably. Yeah. Probably, maybe even more. Yeah. Hotels were probably only between forty dollars a night, fifty dollars a night for a really nice hotel. Yeah. I live in a wrong era. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but and also, you know, when you think about it, 
the highways are pretty empty about five or six o'clock back then. People didn't drive all, everybody wasn't work driving. Everything mm-hmm. wasn't a de- destination. You know, there was not a lot of people uh, driving after six or seven o'clock, but especially between five and six, everybody get off the road, everybody. And it's September, um, probably school probably had not quite, well, it was the end of September. So I'm guessing probably school had started. So there wasn't that many people on the road, but um, we just decided to take the Volvo and we went up um to Flagstaff from San Diego, actually from Imperial Beach where we lived. And uh, we had everything for a fun trip, any amount of coolers, anything you could need for any emergency because she was super prepared. I was too. And we had camped together for years, so we knew each other well. And some wagons. So you have the room, right, Susan? Oh, plenty of plenty of room. I remember asking, can we put a deadhead sticker on it? And they're like, no way. (laughs) So, Um, we were going to stop. The first place we were going to stop would be Denver. And then we were, um, we were going to see our friends, Julie and Will in Illinois, all, all military people that I had known for years. Uh, Karen and Rick, who I had taken the weird trip and that shoe thing happened, had started dating. So we were going to stop in Indiana and see Rick and meet his family and then go to North Carolina. So we had a lot of plans and we had had a, uh, our friend Jackie, her dad had, um, he was a professional truck driver. So he kind of showed us where not to go. This is not bad highway here, bad highway, you know? So he had kind of given us a good, a good route. And we had gone to AAA and back then they gave you a cross country book with something called a trip tick. And it kept your mileage. You could keep your mileage every time you gassed up, how to figure your mileage. These are the places you're going to stop, circles for hotel reservations, all those kind of things. Wow. Our whole trip was on a book. Um, Old school GPS. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> we even we even had tap, uh, 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 topographical maps in case we wanted to go off road. Um some of the four wheel trails that were good enough for our Volvo and um, uh, forest roads Mm. that if we wanted to go so that we could get off the highway and really see America, you know, really see the United States. Um, And Rick had given us those because he had done that before in the Jeep. So when we left, you know, we were really excited. We went, it was fun. We had been all the way up to Flagstaff many times before, but this time, uh, we went north and we saw the South Grand Canyon and, you know, a couple hours here and there and then up the east side and all the red rock. It was like a Fred Flintstone land, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And um, and then up to the North Canyon and then it started getting closer to dusk. So we went through. St. George, Utah, and up to Cedar City. And when we got to Cedar City, you're pretty high up, like 4,000 4, something. And we got gas, and it was probably close to 9 o'clock on September 14th, 1978. It was probably up close to 9 o'clock because everything was getting ready to close. And we were making the decision to not keep our reservation and to just keep driving into the night because it was a full moon and it was a really warm, beautiful night. So it would be ridiculous to give that up. And we were still exhilarated from the day. So we got gas and we enjoyed this beautiful 360 sunset. Every direction was like a Maui sunset. I have never, I'll never forget it. She'll never forget it. We talk about it all the time. And um, and we just drove north on Interstate 15 into the desert. And we were going to go 15 to 80. And then was it 70, 80? And go across to Grand Junction was the mm-hmm. ultimate goal. Um, and it was th- about 360 or 370 miles, something like that. Um, so the sun, uh, the sun set. And then as we're going north and we pull out with a full tank of gas, 
the moon started coming over the mountains to the east, to the right of us. Now there's mountains to the right and the left of us because we're going through a pass in Utah. And then we'll come out of the pass north and then go east into Colorado. That's the plan. We can see it. We can see it on the map. We know where we're going. Well, as the moon came up, it was super bright and the stars all just popped out. It was just a perfect evening for driving in the desert. And it was so bright that um, I remember telling Karen, let's turn the lights off and drive with the headlights off. You know, we did that, played the moon shadow game, you know, blinking the lights on and off. And I remember it is so weird because I was telling um, I put the music on and I remember it was Steely Dan, Dr. Wu from Katie Lied. Um, it was like our favorite, it was my favorite CD. And I turned it on, it was blasting and the windows were down. And I told Karen, you know, I had the most fun camping in the desert with Rick. And I told her the story just real quick. I hope we see some of those jackrabbits that darted across the highway when I was with Rick back in Anza Borrego. I said, there's these big old jackrabbits that but they just went really quick, like a road runner. It's, you see it and they're gone. That was what I said. And that's what I remember trying to tell her. It was, they were like the, the weirdest jackrabbits and then let that story go. Then we noticed the moon coming up and we did the moon game. And then all of a sudden, I remember looking up through the windshield and looking out to the right. The moon had gone, had disappeared. It was nowhere. It, I, I laid the seat all the way back, crawled over to the back, to the left side, to the uh, left side of the car. It was not in the sky there. It wasn't in the sky here. Karen was looking and she was like, well, that's odd. You know, I was concerned. I had this weird fearful something come over me because not only did the moon go dark, but the stars went dark. And the fear just changes your perception of everything. And at that same time, my mouth's getting really dry. So excuse me. And Karen, just uh, so Karen, I'm thinking of your friend, Karen, uh, Susan, you're mentioning that, um, you know, like the moon should have been a lot higher in the sky at this point. It shouldn't be hiding behind any of the mountains on your sides. Well, yeah. It should be clearly visible in the sky at this point. It was already up. I mean, yeah. we were we were enjoying how beautiful it was and thinking about, well, by the time, you know, a couple more hours go by, we can drive the whole way with our, our lights on. Right. There was and there. Yeah, and you were mentioning your windows were down. You guys are sticking your heads outside the, oh. the window. You're having a blast yeah, on the yeah. highway. It's all yours, yeah. right? And then all of a sudden, the moon is gone. And you know, and then Karen's paying attention. And I even remember saying, maybe we need to find a, this makes no sense, one of those pullouts to where we can see if it's over on the left side. But it's it just came up. So how can it be on the left side? It just came up on the right side. We're doing all of that really quick out loud thoughts and then next thing you know Karen just stops the car she's driving she just stops the car and it was only a two lane the interstate was only a two lane at the time there was no four lane they were just kind of building it in parts but there was only two lanes and we stopped in the highway not on the side in the road and it had to be about 930 because the moon comes up about 915 or 920. And it had only been up just a few minutes. So when she stopped, it was just the headlights on the highway. And the moon and the stars were gone, so there's no other light. It's just freaking dark and scary. But we already have this odd perception. And it God knows why we opened up the doors and we got out and walked you, to the. Did you feel we, weird at this point, Susan? Oh, like, I, I, oh, my head was. There was a bizarre feeling because the moon and the stars were gone, and your whole perception changes to fear because nothing explains that, you know. And I've got that ex-military mind just darting ideas, darting ideas. 
I think I'm probably spitting them out of my mouth. And she's doing the same thing because she was her, her father's a naval hero. She's I'm sure she's doing the same thing. We're trying to figure it out. But then we get quiet. And doors open. I don't remember why. I don't remember walking to the front of the car. I kind of do, but I don't know why. But then we're standing in front of the headlights. And in front of us, yeah. If I yeah. Can show it here, yeah. In front of us are about 30 jackrabbits, big three foot jackrabbits. They're on the road giant jackrabbits so in the headlights that's all you can see and they're scattered and we're standing maybe 10 feet away from them and there's no time to think or reason or anything because as soon as we saw all the jackrabbits and we're standing there all of a sudden this huge white light comes down i don't know how else to say white light it was like a foggy white thick liked and it went over the car and over us and over all the jackrabbits over the road just the whole big area and the car shut off and the music went silent and the headlights are gone and all there is is that white light and the jackrabbits which all had their back to us in different poses some squatting some sitting some standing, but they were all moving very slowly. But when the white light hit us and everything went silent, the car just turned off and it was just us and Jack Rapids. They all turned around at the exact same time, kind of like, eh, 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 eh. not necessarily mechanical, but odd. Like and a Lego we- head, like a, for, for people play with Lego, you know, the little Lego guys, yeah. whenever you spin their heads, it would be yeah. like in quarters almost. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and their ears were gone and all of a sudden it was gray aliens, which it took me two years to be able to say that. That is exactly how it was. Just like that from jackrabbits to that. Yeah. And, and then, then we woke up in a diner in Grand Junction, Colorado, with our heads on the table and looked at each other because the waitress said, honey, it's time to wake up now. I'll never forget that voice. Kind of sounds like Siri in my head. Uh, Honey, it's time to wake up now. And we woke up to look at each other in a strange place. The car was outside and the sun was coming up it was 6 28 a.m as i saw the clock and i said what time is it she says 6 28 a.m she asked if we wanted anything i pulled this as a recreation of the diner scene that, so, i wish that, everybody could see jason's art for this it's really incredible it, it yeah. is amazing he literally puts me right back there every time he said it i got stunned i got the sunrise in the back with the mountains as best as i could right yep right so so we we, we, there's no other word other than shock shaking where are we who is she how did the car get out there it's sunrise how did we get here and about and how far is Grand Junction, Colorado, from where you think you were when this happened? 360 miles. And what time was it, Susan, when you uh It was 9.30 when the jackrabbit stopped us in the road, and it was 6.28 a.m. And the sun was just coming over that row of mountains, and there was one bright red mesa across the street from the diner. And I do remember little flashes of seeing that standing with Karen getting out of the driver's side and me being towards the front of the car, walking over and being hit by this really hot furnace wind when the sun peaked through the low rises of the mountain and everything lit up red. But the only big red thing that stood 
was across the street. It was at a distance was that one big red Mesa that we, and we both remember that to this day. Um, but we don't remember anything, how we got there. And when we woke up, we were covered with radiation burns, like red welts and our skin was burning like we were on fire and very dry and uh, so stunned that we weren't even emotional yet. Our emotions hadn't had time to catch up with, the, oh my God, what's happened to us? We just would look at each other with this almost like a comatose smile, uh, a gaze, like, I guess to, to this day you'd say, are, are you feeling this? <laughs> you know, I'm not quite sure. Why are we here? Where are we? When I said, where are we? She said, Grand Junction, Colorado. And it just like blew my mind up. Because at that split second, I didn't even remember at that split second about the jackrabbits. I remembered falling from the sky, literally falling from the sky and seeing I was having flash, flash, flash in my head where I couldn't even tell Karen what I was seeing in my head. I was thinking she remembered everything that had happened. She was thinking I remembered, but there was no remembering. Uh, um, I knew about the jackrabbits. I could still see them flashing in my head. But how we got from the jackrabbits to Colorado. We 360 have miles away. Yeah. And here, covered and, in radiation burns. Yeah, yeah, and, and you could feel them. They were starting to blister, like as we sat there. So I have no clue how long we sat there, but somehow we went to some kind of hotel. And I remember it being a gross, old, like old cinder block hotel. It's not any place that we would have ever gone, and I don't even know how we got there. But the car was there, so I guess we drove. But I think we were just under some kind of um, it was some kind of blocked mental state. There's, I really don't know how you couldn't think a thought out of what was going on, like right here, right now, except I was having the flashing, like a strobe, like memories of falling from the sky and I couldn't talk to her about it. And then we, at the hotel, I remember opening the door and her just falling on the bed in the fetal position and me trying to take a shower and burning. And then just laying down beside her and holding her really close because I was scared to death that we were going to be separated. Yeah. That was just like that. Um, I, I was afraid that we were going to be that somehow we would get separated and I couldn't figure out how we ended up there and didn't even know how we got there, but we slept about 20 hours. So we woke up later on in the evening and tried to talk a little bit. There's no talking. We ate snacks that we had in the car, um, but we were really nauseous. Uh, I was just so sick. I'll never forget how nauseously sick I was. Your head feels like it's blowing up. Everything hurts. You feel burned. Um, and you can't speak because when you tried to speak about what had happened, it would go uh, 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 like that. And it would, it would be like everything's on the tip of your tongue, but nothing will come out. And it was so frustrating and confusing that we just stopped and got quiet. But the next morning we went to the car and it still had a full tank of gas and the mileage was not on the car. It was the same mileage back. Nine hours pass. Well, which, which you know because you had this miles. book. You were keeping track of your mileage during the yeah. thing, so that's how you would you would know. Um, yeah. Me, can I ask questions just to make sure I'm getting like all the details right yeah. here? So this happens around soon after moonrise that night. Mm -hmm. You're driving. The headlights are off and on because you're sort of playing with the. The moon yeah. shadow in the desert, which is something I've done driving on road trips. It's it's beautiful. It is, yeah. 
you're, you're doing this and, and suddenly you can't locate the moon. So you sort of frantically look around increasingly frantically. And then you eventually your friend stops and she stops because she saw these rabbits in the road. Is that how you understand? She doesn't, it? She doesn't even remember stopping and she doesn't remember oh. the. It's a blip. You mentioned it was like kind of like a blip. All of a sudden they stop and they don't know why and they feel weird. Yeah. yeah. All of a sudden it's like, why did we stop? Because we've discussed it, you know, I mean, just last week even. And we laugh because she said, you know, that's not like us because we would have just hit the gas and smashed those rabbits and just kept on going like Thelma and Louise and I. I have, I, you know, I'm super tender about animals, but with the fear that's associated at the time with this, we probably would have just cruised on through, but we don't know why we stopped. I'm sure it's because our minds didn't belong to us at that point. And I was already feeling that because nothing was making sense. And it was like bombarded with fear and wonder and how that happened in science and everything was happening all at once. Yeah. It's just a, a total overload. So, so you stopped yeah. the car for whatever reason you initially perceived these things as rabbits being in the road, but then yeah. it, very large um, rabbits though. They're three feet, three foot. They were huge, yeah. but, but total jackrabbity just completely. And there, there are rabbits that large. I don't know if they're, they're desert jackrabbits. There are, but they're, they're like English lot rabbits that are just absolutely enormous. So it's not implausible that there would be these en enormous large rabbits. Right. But they would be all clustered in the road. But then you, is, is it, is it your belief that what was really there were these gray beings that your mind initially sort of tried to interpret as rabbits. And then suddenly you realize what you were actually seeing or do you think that there really were rabbits there initially, and then there really were these other things there? No, I think they were shapeshifters, and they were there, and then they turned into their real their real selves. So, so, you, so you would think that if I had been there, I would have initially seen them as rabbits too, and then I would have seen them as the sort of gray beings. I that, believe so because the, the it's so. Here's what's so weird is during hypnosis. And when I tell the story without thinking about the hypnosis, this memory, and then it's not blended anywhere with the hypnosis. It's only when I activate that in my mind that I can blend the two. And I know I saw jackrabbits. They were lanky, furry, that brownish Rabbit. gray. Rabbity. Rabbity rabbit. But, and and the interesting part, rabbits. Yeah. yeah. And the interesting part, Michael, is that she had just mentioned yeah. about seeing jackrabbits. Wanting and to that's see. yeah. And yeah. um, similar to uh John Yost. And when John Yost was a little kid, he's about seven, eight years old, he went to the bathroom, and when he opened up the door middle of the night, he opened up the door and his exact height, but looking at him is Ultraman, because he was obsessed yeah. with Ultraman. But he was afraid of Ultraman. And he doesn't know why. And then under hypnosis, he realized it wasn't Ultraman. It was a gray. And yeah. it wasn't Ultraman trying to grab him. It was the gray trying to grab him. And brought him out to the desert. Same desert as you were mentioning before. Um, and it was almost like ant-like entities. And it, it was underground. But he knew there was humans there too. Like it was almost like a an operation of some sort, but he knew he was on earth. He knew he was under the ground. So the projection, a lot of people say that too. Like they'll see like, Oh, it was a little kid. What was that little kid doing there? And then under hypnosis, they realize it wasn't a kid. Right. Um, so it's very similar to this, but this is the first time that I've heard that you saw 30 of them. It was just not one individual one, but they oh, projected it across the board. Yeah, they were scattered down the highway. In other words, if you were to hit one, you would have had to go boom, 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 which grosses me out thinking about it. Which you I'm would have sure given us some evidence, Susan, if you did that. We would yeah. have had bodies. Oh, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But um, it, it's so weird because during hypnosis, I still saw jackrabbits. I never just saw aliens. They were jackrabbits until they turned around. Once they turned around and you see those giant eyes, what was so sh shocking is when I was screaming, where's the moon and the stars? 
the moon and the stars were in the giant eyes of the aliens when they turned around. That's what was so shocking. I asked the question and there it is. That's it. It was like the whole galaxy. Excellent. That, Another excellent illustration by Jason here. And Thank nothing you. Thanks that so I much. Could, that whatever was above us was so huge that it blocked out the moon and the stars. But that wasn't at the time anything that I would have ever thought as rational. That, that was my next question. You think that that the moon and the stars really were there, but they, they were occluded by some object above you. Yes, and it made sense because years later when MUFON, when I called them and they got the investigator and also Preston found some good stuff is that on that same highway within less than 50 miles Within the same evening of that exact date, people had reported to MUFON from seeing something tremendous in the sky. And one or two people had talked about one of them, his daughter was in the car and had paced beside them and the daughter was freaked out. So they pulled over and let it pass. And the other one was a man who pulled over on the side of 15. They were going south with a whole lot of other cars and they all got out of their car on the highway, pulled over to the side and watched it pass without talking to each other and acknowledging they were all seeing it. And then he, they all drove away and he mentioned in um, the report that he had, he was confused at the feeling of confusion as to why nobody had talked about or said, man, do you see that? Or, it, so he, but he said it was gigantic, like a couple of aircraft carriers, which makes sense because it was the same night in the same place where I was. It, to hear well, that, that all these years yeah. was so exciting. I'm sure, yeah. Good. I mean, anybody hearing that you're not crazy after you've had uh, yeah. <laughs> a experience is really exciting. So, um, so just to, to complete the recap, you're you're standing there. These creatures turn around at you. You realize. They've they're they're now in this different form than you initially perceived them to be, and then this, or or at some point during all this, a super bright light shone yeah. upon you. It and came down. It was the transition. Yeah. So we saw we we were standing there with the jackrabbits, and then everything cut off. Shh, white light. They turn around, look at us. I remember, however long it takes to think. Oh my God, the moon and the stars are in their eyes, and. At that point, I know I could still move my eyes and look around because I was trying to take everything in. And I remember grabbing Karen with my left hand like you would grab a sack of potatoes if you have a child sitting at the car and you're getting ready to slam mm -hmm. on brakes so you keep them from falling. I grabbed her and I remember specifically doing that. And until I had hypnosis, I, I've always wondered why it's because we were moving up. So oh, like let's, yeah. This this is the great part because for years, I mean decades, you did not know what happened between 930 when you the jackrabbits to the diner 360 miles away yeah. in you know uh, a, a small diner in the morning. Um under hypnosis now, let, walk us through what you recall after you and Karen were lifted up. Um, I recall being on a table that's kind of suspended, it just had a single pedestal thing. And I don't even know how I saw that. I because think I drew it. I'm going to see if I can. Yes, yeah, I did. You did. You did. And um, I remember there being something right beside me on a being being right beside me on the right. It wasn't a jackrabbit. It was definitely an alien. And it's really weird because I've never been able to say those words until Karen and I talked in, in 22, 2022. We found each other again. And, and she said, what was what was that? And um, I said, well, it wasn't a jackrabbit. And she said, well, just say it. What was it? And I said, it was a gray. And I just couldn't say it. And she said, was it a gray alien? Just say it. And I that was when I finally was able to say it. So it took all those years to be able to say it was a gray alien. 
And I, I've always known that, but to say it was kind of powerful, I'm glad um, because all these years we couldn't speak, Karen and I, but after the trip and, and she went back, uh, I went back and she was dating Rick and I was dating Chuck, my husband of 35 years after that. We got married shortly after that. And the, it gave us a, a little bit of a, a break in having to talk to each other since we were roommates because it was very hard to talk to each other because every thought went back to what had happened on that trip and trying to explain it to which we just kind of put it aside because there was no explanation and to talk about it, she would have lost her job and I would have never found one, <laughs> you know, I, that's just how bad it was back then, but we were both drawn to, uh, those subjects in all these years, you know, I do remember um, uh, all the little pieces uh, of like Bud Hopkins book and um, Deborah Cobble is her real name, but um, I remember her as Kathy Davis and they were kind of my, she was kind of my hero. I haven't met her yet, but one day I hope to meet her soon. Um, but those things kept me going and it gave me something to hang on to. But um, let's go back to your question. I think I, I probably got off of it. No, oh. no, this, this is great. Yeah. So the, the only, the, the tail end of it was that you wake up in this diner at six something in the morning, which is like, you know, I don't know what, nine yeah. hours later. Um, yeah. So it was, it would have been six hours of drive time if it's 360 road miles. I'm not sure if it's 360 <laughs> Linear miles or 360? Oh, no, road miles. It's road miles. Okay. 360 road miles. Yeah. So six hours of driving time. So there's about three hours there unaccounted for. Um, but you, you wake up and you say you have, you call them radiation burns. And for the audience, I, I can hear that there's some skeptical voice. It's going to say, don't radiation burns take weeks to show up? But but no, that radiation poisoning itself can take weeks to show up. But radiation burns yeah. is called erythema. <laughs> is ionizing radiation is like a sunburn within about 24 hours you start getting blisters and redness and itching yeah. and all things as if you just stayed but, out in the sun yeah. but um, now under the hypnosis we know why uh susan and karen suffered and they did suffer after this quite greatly um but could, could you bring us back onto oh, okay. this craft uh, susan and let us know what you recall under hypnosis of what what took place well, I, I kept, I do remember that I kept asking, like, where's Karen? And they kept telling me she's on her own journey. She's on her own adventure. She's wherever. But I could always feel like she was back behind me, but not in the room. And I could never hear her or anything else. And they spoke but, audibly to you with their mouths? No, it was so weird all in your head. It was just like a normal conversation, but you didn't have to move your mouth. And it's really weird because I, was very aware that I didn't have to move my mouth. You didn't have I, to move your mouth either. Okay, interesting. No, I, I I remember thinking, you know, like, where am I? And where's Karen? And then they would tell me. And I think, well, did I ask that? Because that's a natural, because I didn't ask that, meaning speaking. You just thought it, yeah. Yeah, and then I remember thinking, oh, looking at their skin and thinking, because he was right here. I really want to touch him. And he said, that's okay. You can touch me. And I remember taking this hand and just rubbing it down his arm. It would be, you know, equivalent to rubbing just like this. And you know how, if you rub your arm, you, you'll make little wrinkles and an indention. Well, it didn't make any indention. It was just kind of slick, like a, like a dolphin, but like a dolphin skin with foam rubber underneath. But it was very dry, like an elephant skin, if that makes sense. It just didn't have the hair on it. It was hairless. Um, so you could push like, into it a little bit. That's what you mean by the foam rubber. Yeah, on like foam foot. rubber on it. But it, was, it, it looked like it would be wet, yeah. but it wasn't. It was just kind of kind of shiny and um, wrinkly. But it didn't wrinkle when you pushed in on it like we do. So... Um, and then when I took my finger away, I could smell it. And it was so gross because I was like, ooh. And as soon as I said, ooh, 
it said, oh, you know, that's not like a ooh. But this is what's the funniest part. It was like a strange banter. That's not like a ooh. It's I am you and you me. We're just like. And I You're remember. Friendly. Yeah, and I remember exactly. But but it was it wasn't in a it wasn't correcting me like in a scolding way. It was just kind of like a giggle. And um, I remember thinking, mm -mm, I'm, that's not me. That's not that's my not skin. Me. Yeah. So it smelled like stinky Parmesan cheese in a baby wet baby diaper. Like like baby like, diaper, you mean is in, is in poop or is in pee, urine? Like in, yeah, like in urine. Like a pee diaper with. Uh, the ammonia Rocky, smell Rocky. is is mentioned yeah. quite a bit, Michael. Yeah. Uh, Uric acid, and ammonia. ammonia, and parmesan. Yeah. But, but, but the stinky parmesan, like really stinking parmesan. So now when I smell parmesan, I, it does kind of go through my mind. It's it's a quick. I, I'll giggle because no matter where I'm at, I think about that because I, it's not like I wanted to smell smell it. It was just like I did smell it. And then it was. Has like, it ruined parmesan cheese for you though? Like, can you still no, eat it? No, I still love parm. Yeah. Okay. Because it's not rotting farm, but this is not like rotting farm. So um, that was odd. And then I remember uh, I'm sitting up at the time, and then I remember being laid down. And right before I got laid down, I whoever was beside me had those long, skinny arms and went around to the back of me, and something went in my neck. It was a sound like a. Compressed air, air sort of stuff. Yeah. yeah. It, it reminded me of having the swine flu shots on both sides in the service Ch -ch -ch, with the big gun with the big round thing on it. Mm -hmm. it, it, it that's kind of how I pictured it, but this, I didn't see it. Mm -hmm. um, and then I know there was something, someone else in the room, but I didn't see it because I was laid down and then I could feel work on my right side where my appendix and um, my ovary and it's then in that right lower quadrant. And I remember pressure, but I have no clue what they did. And then I remember falling from the sky. And that was the scariest part is falling. Falling straight down and seeing the curve of the earth and seeing the sun come up through the cracks of the lowest parts of the mountain. And it lit up everything red all of that red rock below me which is the same area between utah and colorado where i disappeared that's what is in there hmm. it just giant mesa after mesa after red rock after red rock and i was falling really fast and i think that's where i got the radiation burns because i could feel my skin burning um, so you by fall from a sky then you mean fall from space if you could see the curvature of the earth, that's like yeah. really fucking high. I could see Sorry, black <laughs> and then blue and then white and then hazy and then and then I'm in our atmosphere. I could feel and see them. I even drew a picture where I could see the curve of the earth. I could see all the red rock below and it was getting brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter because the sun was coming up and hitting the low peaks of the mountains. And so it was shooting the light in. And now that I'm not so afraid of that thought, it was quite amazing what I saw. It was like taking a halo jump, you know, without, without yeah. a mask. <laughs> when I think about that. Um, but you don't remember struggling for air or feeling super cold or the wind burning? No, I remember burning. I remember it burning my skin. I remember that's where I, that's the only time I remember my skin burning, which is from wind friction or from, from ionizing from, radiation from the sun. That's not being well, filtered by our atmosphere. That's what I'm thinking is what happened is because when I, that was right before I ended up in the diner. That was the, to me, it was the, my last thought when I woke up in that diner was that and that burning feeling. And I had that burning feeling. So I kind of associated it to that. Because I remember as I was falling, it was almost like a, a very fast fall, but in slow motion. Does that make sense? Like a car accident. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a car accident, uh, because I've been in two now. Uh, 
everything happens fast. You feel it fast, but your your brain shows you slides. Yes. Of what's happening. And like, you'll be here and your arms are like this. And the next one, you're like this. Like That's exactly right. Oh my gotcha. goodness. Exactly right. Gotcha. And I was just like falling, just falling. And I think I had a little dress on, uh, a little cotton dress, which I don't remember having a cotton dress on when all the jackrabbit thing happened. And I don't even remember which one it was, but it's funny because we have pictures of that trip that Karen sent me for Christmas. She found in an old uh, album and it must have gotten much cooler after we left there because we had on warmer clothes. I had on like long sleeves, but then I think maybe I wore long sleeves to cover up my burns because I was super weird about uh, when we woke up in that hotel, we were supposed to go to Denver and see some close friends from Hawaii when I was stationed there. And I, we didn't go and I gave them some blown off excuse because we didn't have phones, you know, back then you have to go to a pay phone and call them. And I remember just talking a minute and saying, we aren't, we're not coming. I'll explain later. Well, she was on the show when, with, with Preston um, in the chat. And she said, after all of these years, you know, this was just like last year, after all of these years, now I know why you didn't come to visit because it bought, it hurt me that you didn't show up, but we knew, you know, they just accepted it all those years. And now she understands why, because you can't go looking with, with, you look like a desert burned out desert rat <laughs> and, you know, and you've got radiation burns and you just Plus show you're up. sick, right? Yeah. Yeah it, yeah. it just wouldn't have made any sense. So, so we so went to a hotel and stayed for three days. So, yeah, what I would say is let's make this, we'll, we'll tie up episode one of this right now, and then we'll continue uh, with episode two with um, Earl and, um, uh, oh, I keep forgetting the gentleman from Move Richard. Forward, Richard. Richard yeah. Vanessa. We'll, we'll have him on as well, and then we're going to talk about, we'll, we'll take it from the hotel. Um, after you left the hotel, and then you start skipping on friends because you're not feeling good. Um, there's more that happens. You get violently ill and your dad helps you out. But then there's more developments later on based on the abduction. So trust me, guys, you want to listen to part two because the story just, it's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. There's a reason why we're doing a part two. Um, what an incredible story, Susan. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. This yeah, there's amazing. more. There's more to come for sure. Um, so what we'll do, uh, Susan, is that we'll, we're going to schedule a part two. You and I could discuss this after the fact um, with uh, Richard and Earl. And uh, we'll, we'll get this going uh, probably within the next week or two. And then we could put up both episodes at the same day so people have access. If they want to binge listen or, or, or watch it, they can. Uh, but I sure. think that'd be the best best thing for us to do. Susan, sure. thank you so much for your time today. It was awesome. I mean, there's so much to your to your life events, yeah. but this one is so amazing uh, as a story. Like I said, I've been delving into your story quite a bit with the artwork and texting back and forth with you, making sure I have everything correct and asking yeah. for the little details. The but artwork just I'm so honored by that. It is just the most beautiful. Fantastic. Hey, I'm, I'm honored to do it. And you guys could use it for uh, whenever you want to tell your story. Uh, if ever I publish a book, though, um, then that's all I'll, I'll, I'll use these pictures as well to tell your story for sure. Uh, there's more to come. I'm still not done drawing. I still got a few more drawings to do on your case, but uh, I'm honored to be able to do it. Uh, guys, please like and subscribe uh, on, well, pretty much we're everywhere now, Michael. Uh, YouTube is starting to really pick up. We did have to restart the channel, uh, but I think we're up at 1,200, almost 1,300 uh, subscribers now. So within nice. a short short distance of time of having to reactivate it to now, we're doing pretty good. And uh, it, it's just, it's great. It's it's great to be back. It's great to have uh, you know amazing guests like Susan back on and learning. Uh, you know, learning about our experience and it ties in with the research that we've been doing as well, Michael. Uh, Michael, do you have any last questions to ask our guest today? We'll ask about the books, I think, in the next episode. Yeah, yeah, no. Well, I, I have some some standard last questions that I asked, but we'll just save those for the for the very end of the show. And I'm just so so like taken by this. Let me just ask one thing. What is the um what is the documentary 
that you mentioned watching that sort of triggered a lot of these thoughts for you. So we can put that in the show notes. Uh, so I can go watch John it. Yost um, was the producer and it was Alien Abduction Answers. Alien Abduction Answers. I'll go watch that before next time and we'll have plenty of... Oh, definitely. You definitely should because you see the whole process of John discovering and then the hypnosis and then what he did with it. And um, that's what was so awful is that we've lost him and he was in the middle of his work, but I know that even from the other side, he is not, he's going to finish it. There is no doubt in my mind. Well, even done. what he did was to motivate you and motivate others to step up and yeah. speak up, right? Uh, but, John, we, we did an interview with John Yost uh, about a year ago, a year and a half ago. Great interview. It was based on that movie and his experience as well. So you could always listen to that episode, too. He was really awesome. And we lost him, too. I think it was pancreatic cancer. Yes. Um, quite aggressive. So he died this week, he, unfortunately. He wrote me a note and he said, a lot of things are going to come your way in the next year. And I want you to know that you should take every one of them. I want you to know you should do it all and yeah. tell your story. Yeah. Yeah. It and was the sweetest. I'm so glad it was. And I fully final. agree with them. Like uh, tell everybody uh, and we'll do our best to tell, you know, our listeners are going to love this. And it's a story worth telling. And there's more to come, obviously, for part two. Thank you so much, guys, for listening. And uh, we'll be back with part two on the UAP Studies podcast.